The Cranky Geek WebRTC Spring 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors. Google, Agora, Element, Dolby I.O., Twilio, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. So hi everyone again. Uh, with me now is Ben Wicks from Agora. Ben has been within the WebRTC community for many years. I've seen him in previous events, not the Cranky Geek ones, though in, in form, I guess. Uh, and he's going to talk today about distributed, distributed SFUs using virtual networks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sahi. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ben Weeks, and I'd like to show you how to run WebRTC video calls with better quality and scale than I realized was possible until recently. Um, have my slides disappeared? I can just see myself. No, no, that's fine. OK, cool. Um, so first, a quick look at some old photos. And um, this is me back at the very beginning of WebRTC nearly 10 years ago. Um, and I've been heavily involved with the technology ever since. But only in the last year have I realized that some of the fundamental architectural assumptions that I've held firmly in my head um, are not entirely true anymore. And let's have a look at those. So I used to say things like, you only got two people in the conference, you might as well go peer to peer, the quality would be better. Or I'd hear things like, um, they're using a VPN, no wonder the quality sucks. Or a single SFU placed geographically in the middle of a group is going to give you better results than a distributed SFU or bridging where you've got extra hops involved. And all of this has turned out not to be not to be the case, actually. So let's have a little look at um, a simple peer-to-peer -peer call between someone in London and someone in India. Um, it looks like it's the packets are going to go the shortest possible distance, the shortest path. And on each end, you've got the browser um, doing its dynamic bandwidth adaptation and calculating the forward error correction and giving you the best possible experience for that line of packets. Um, and whatever you're going to do, the people are still going to be on the same internet connection at home, you know, regardless of what you do in the middle. That's the, that's the kind of thinking that I used to have. And if I was to put an SFU in the middle, that's only going to make things worse because there's an extra hop and I'm stopping the browsers from having that direct end-to-end -end ability to calculate the bandwidth and to calculate the FEC. So it's only going to be worse. This is the best you can possibly have. But it turns out that that's not the case. And I'm going to quickly show you what what a better architecture looks like, and then give you a demo of it. So what we have here is an SFU placed in the IP network of the ISP at each end of the call, and a couple of SFUs in between, which are routing the, the packets over the most optimum path between those two users. And I'm going to give you a little demo now, which I recorded just yesterday with a colleague of mine. And before I press play, let me explain what's going on here. On the left, I've got a, a Chrome window with AppRTC running. Um, so the, our browsers have exchanged SDP, and we're running over the public internet peer-to-peer. -peer. And on the right, another Chrome window, and we're both in an Agora channel. And Agora are operating the architecture that I just showed before, which they call SDRTN, or Software Defined Real-Time Network. And now let's look at the two in action. You'll hopefully hear the audio from the video. And I'm basically going to ask my colleague, Vineeth, to move his hand. And everything in this, is, in this test is exactly the same. We've got the same network, sorry, the same internet connections on each end, the same devices, the same browsers. The only thing that's different is the public internet versus Agora's real-time network. OK, press play. And one more time, put it up to the middle position still. And quickly down. Brilliant. Oh, yeah, do that one more time. It's, it's really good. Into the middle and still. Down quickly. It's incredible. It's almost a second quicker. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Vineet. Have a good day. Speak to you soon. Yeah, speak to so just a quick one, one, yeah. one question then. So 
these are two screens running at the same time on his side and yours. You're just opening it in two browser tabs and he's doing the same. Correct. Yeah, you could just about see the, the uh, URL bars of the two. You've got AppRTC mm -hmm. on the left and an Agora demo page on the right. Okay. And then below each window, I've got WebRTC internals, so showing the round trip time for each call. And for the public internet, it was moving from between 200 and 600 milliseconds round trip. But for Agora, it was pretty much a constant 15 milliseconds. And that's because I was talking to an SFU in my own ISP's IP network. Yeah, it's the shortest possible distance, basically me to my ISP. And then everything else was taken care of by, by Agora. And at the other end, exactly the same for Venice um, in India. So I'm now going to try, well, I'll try, oops, sorry, get the right screen here. And one more time. Oops, like here we go. So I'm now going to explain what's going on on the internet, which is kind of the stuff that I wasn't overly aware of perhaps in the past. So at the bottom, these yellow circles are people connected to the internet, like you, me, and Venice at home. And we're generally using tier three ISPs. And those tier three ISPs um, are using tier two ISPs, which tend to cover bigger regions, countries. And they in turn are using tier one ISPs which cover great big, um, you know, which are global in scale. But these are run and operated as businesses by different companies. Um, so they've got their own costs and they're in competition with each other to a certain extent. Well, to a massive extent. Um, and it turns out that an IP's, an ISP's um, priorities of routing traffic are to go, as you can see here, over their own ISP network, and then to use free peering with other ISPs, and then and only then if they have to, to pay for, um, for, for transport. So you end up with lots of strange cases on the internet, like this one, for example, where if you're sending your packets from Mexico to Washington, DC, it's not very far in distance. You'd want to be able to take the green arrows. But what happens in practice for the major ISP out there is you end up sending your packets via Russia because it's the ISP have the agreements with each other and that's the cheapest way for it to flow. And not only is it a longer distance, but it's a much more congested route to be taking. Another thing, um, this comes from the Thousand Eyes 2020 Cloud Performance Report, which I can't recommend enough. There's a link to it um, in the appendix of this, this um, presentation, which you could look at. But it shows that Google um, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, doesn't actually have a direct connection between Europe and India. So if you're transmitting packets that way, they'll go all the way around the globe the other way. And you know, I picked on Google a little bit there, but the report actually points out that all five of the big, big uh, cloud players have different regional and non regional anomalies, anomalies, where they um, each of them have got certain issues depending on what region that you're in. Some rely heavily on the public internet in places. AWS have something called Global Accelerator. But that itself is worse than the actual internet um, for, for many connections um, between their different availability zones. All of these guys um, have a performance hit for in and out of China. And the, sorry, all these points are the summary, uh, the summary of the actual report that I'm referring to. And the last one is that even in the US, the ISP that you're using makes a difference on your connectivity to the different clouds. So if, if you're operating WebRTC conferencing in, in one particular cloud, you're going to be subject to all of these issues from different parts of the world. Sorry, when your users are in different parts of the world or on different ISPs in your own country. So what's the solution? It's actually to put SFUs into every ISP IP network around the globe so that you can connect your users directly on the fastest possible link possible and then to send traffic between your different SFUs so that you can take the premium routes rather than going with the rest of the internet. And this shows that in action, and not only do you send your packets over one primary route, but you can send them, and the way that Agora works is you're sending them over three at one time. It's using machine learning to predict the best paths, and it's continually monitoring those paths in real time and able to switch them in real time to provide next to zero packet loss between any two places in the world at ultra low latency. So it's not just mapping the geographies and then deciding what to send by taking a snapshot. You need to you know, maintain that and dynamically change it as the network changes. 
That's right. Continuous monitoring and probing of the network and the, and the routes available. Okay. And what this achieves in summary is about is speeds, twice the speed of the public internet. Um, but, you know, people have completely varying speeds. But on average, it's twice the speed. But more importantly, all of your users have a much more consistent speed, which is half of the average speed. So everyone in the conference is playing, is playing fairly, is, you know, it levels the playing field, and everyone's seeing and hearing things at the same time. And you have close to zero packet loss from anywhere to anywhere in the world, including in and out of China. This architecture also lends itself really well to solving another problem, which is common in conferencing, SFU land. So this is that single SFU that I described at the beginning, um, which works well in this particular scenario. But when you add a couple of people from over here, their voice is having to be sent all the way to um, East Coast and back just to hear their friend who's not, you know, not that far away. And that's not a very good um, experience. But with SDRTN, or what's also called an overlay network, um, all the packets are taking the most efficient route to all the people. And then the challenge becomes here is to not duplicate everything and to, to send you know, the packets between different regions you know, only once, and then to be able to um, multiply those on those different SFUs and the various different um, SFUs. And the other beauty of this architecture is it sort of scales indefinitely, but Agora tests up to a million people in a single conference. You know, which blew my mind when I when I joined. Um, but it's all true, and it's, it's properly tested. So you can have up to a million people in a conference like this, all with the ultra low latency that I've been describing. And as, if you're a developer like me at heart, then you can have you can rely on having a really good network which scales really well, and focus more on the on the more satisfying CSS things for building beautiful big grids um, which run beautifully in web browsers. And there's plenty more data at the end of my report, but I'm going to, well, sorry, my presentation, but I'm going to stop there and invite any questions. Thank you, Ben. Cranky Geek is possible thanks to Google, as well as industry sponsors. Agora, embed vivid voice and video in any application, on any device, anywhere. Dolby, the API platform for transforming media and communications. Element, talk to everyone through the open global matrix network protected by proper end-to-end -end encryption. Ring Central. Revolutionize your business communications with Ring Central APIs. Twilio. Create real-time video apps that scale as you grow, from free one-to-one -one chats to larger group rooms.